Hi, and welcome back to PGTV. Today, we're exploring the art of storytelling, not the sort of sordid tales that win Oscars, but the increasingly important role of stories and storytellers in moving a policy agenda in Washington. I'm Katie Beck, and I'm here with two Podesta Group principals who are uniquely qualified to weigh in on this underutilized tactic. Please welcome former Republican Staff Director of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, David Marin, and Trey Hardin, former Republican campaign operative and aide to House Republican leadership. Welcome, gentlemen. Morning, Thanks for Good being here. here. Um, so, you know, David, you've been in Washington a long time, and having worked on the Hill for so many years, and now here in your role at Podesta Group managing large communications campaigns for, you know, a variety of nonprofit and corporate clients, you've been on the, both, you know, the receiving end and the pitching end of many high-profile message campaigns. So, what are organizations doing wrong, and really, what are the keys to being heard inside the Beltway? Thanks, Katie. I think I think it's um, you know the kind of thing that we're talking about today should be advocacy 101, but far too often isn't. Uh, I think it's the kind of thing that uh, that the best courtroom attorneys do really well. They spin a narrative, they create a theory of the case that relies less on facts and evidence and more on on creating and, and painting a portrait of their client that resonates and engenders sympathy and compassion from a jury. That's the kind of storytelling that we're talking about, connecting the dots between the message, the messenger, and the person you're trying to influence. And, you know, Trey, while this uh, may seem fairly obvious or even logical in many respects, it really is a departure in thinking from business as usual in Washington and the way things have been done. Um, so, you know, how has lobbying changed in favor of these sorts of tactics? Yeah, well, Katie, it, it, it has changed a lot, in my opinion, in the last eight years, I think, specifically. Um, you know, I've spoken to members on the Hill, uh, other policymakers on the state level, and even had some tell me that there's a genuine fear of doing their job, um, representing their constituents, uh, standing up for legislation or opposing legislation. So it's changed a lot, and this fear is driven by two specific things. One is the media. We now live in a world of a 24-hour news cycle, so uh, the media scrutiny on the motivations behind policymakers is n has never been more intense. And, the se and along the same lines as the social media and the internet, one-day stories can now be stories that last for weeks because of how long they can stay on the internet. And the second uh, re reason behind this fear is that is purely political. Um, these policymakers are constantly thinking about their reelection now. Uh, I would argue that this country is so divided right now that there's no such thing as a safe seat for an elected official anymore, and we clearly have seen how close these presidential races are. So, um, because of that, I think these members don't get a members of Congress and other policymakers don't go get a cup of coffee without thinking about what their voters are thinking about it. So, those sensitivities require. Uh, require a different approach of advocacy. The days of uh, meeting someone uh, meeting someone one-on-one um, -on -one and, and making a request, I think, are really um, diminishing. I think now these members of Congress and policymakers are looking for an army, an army of people, real people, voters, consumers behind them that um, before they decide to be at the tip of the spear on an initiative. So, Katie, what we specialize in as well, uh, pivoting off of that, is, is so who, who are the best uh, soldiers in that army? Um, I think too often folks around town try to uh, focus exclusively, obsessively on data. And it's not that the data is not important, it is. Members do want to know what the job numbers are, what the economic impact numbers are. But without the right messenger for that data, you've, you've only gotten halfway there. Um, I, think, uh, I think what we specialize in and do really successfully here is matching the right, the right messenger to the right target audience. You don't take a white male CEO from Alabama who's probably a, a, a conservative to meet with an African American member from the Northeast. It's not effective. We try to find veterans to talk to veterans. We try to find scientists to talk to scientists. Uh, for example, uh, we represent a coalition of international development companies, the for-profit implementers uh, that partner with USAID around the globe in developing nations. Uh, that budget is always under threat. Uh, and for years, the, the primary argument for proponents of robust funding of foreign aid has been, but it's just 1% of the budget. Well, that's, that's, that's effective if you're talking to people who have, a, who have a, a completely unrealistic sense of the size of the foreign aid budget. But more effective is taking one of those implementers who focuses on women's rights in Afghanistan to talk to a member of Congress who cares about that issue. Taking an implementer who focuses on clean water in Africa and talking to a member of Congress who cares about that issue. You need to connect the dots and identify passions 
and, and find the storytellers to, 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 uh, to reflect that. And so, you know, now that we've sort of addressed the strategy, let's just frankly talk tactics. Um, you know, obviously, no one campaign is exactly alike, but just sort of walk us through quickly, as you already sort of have started doing, um, the general process of getting a storyteller-driven campaign off the ground. Yeah, it takes, it takes persistence and it takes creativity. I mean, uh, you know, so for example, we also represent the golf industry. And I think a mistake that, that the industry made, and it's common among, across the board with industries, associations, and companies, for years they, they parachuted into Washington once a year with the same, uh, the same 12 uh, executives from golf industry companies, talked to the same 15 members of Congress who were already passionate about golf. That's not moving the needle. What we've done is taken uh, discrete segments of the, of the golf industry across the country, the nearly two million Americans whose jobs uh, are tied to the golf industry, and, and put them in the room with people who will care about what they do and care about why they do it. That has moved the needle for golf. Yeah, and I, and I would add, um, you know, it's the government relations element is still vital and it's still important, but it must be augmented by a sound communications and public affairs strategy, building that army of real people I've talked about, and as well, the the story that you're that you're ready to tell and determining who you tell it to has to be relevant to what the pressure points are up on the hill or at the state legislative level or at the White House. So it's um it's really making that making the story relevant, making the storytellers relevant uh, as well and or credible, um, so that there's you know non-traditional voices that are speaking to these policymakers so that they feel that they have that uh, universal support. If you, if you haven't done your homework on, on the, the member of Congress that you're trying to, to, uh, to influence, then you, you probably ha don't know enough to have the right storyteller in the room. What makes that man or woman tick? What, you know, what, what was their family like growing up? What are their hobbies? What are their passions? What are their interests? That's the kind of homework you have to do in order to be able to go out and identify the right storyteller. And you know, probably um, as part of these strategies, another tactic that frankly warrants its own conversation, social media and digital strategy. Um, you know, Trey, there's a lot of talk in, you know, sort of the news business and around, around about social media and the power of effective digital mm -hmm. strategy. And we've certainly seen plenty of evidence to this effect in recent presidential and other political campaigns. So how important is the digital component to advocacy and how can savvy digital strategy really change policy outcomes? Well, it's, Katie, it's crucial. I mean, when we talk about the new world of advocacy, uh, there's nothing that represents that more than the new world that we're in in terms of the information age and, and where we're getting our news. Where do people get their news? It's not from the new, it's not from the paper newspaper that's dropped off on their doorstep anymore. It's on the internet. Where do congressional staff or state legislative staff get their news? Again, off of the internet. Um, that is where the game is right now. That is the arena right now. And um, I, you know, I'm constantly blown away with the, almost on a daily basis, with the digital team here at the Podesta Group in terms of uh, being on the cutting edge of new ideas and tactics that they're discovering because I think those are evolving and changing every day. But the most, the, the, the most interesting element of it, the most strategic element of it, is how targeted you can be in reaching people, in recruiting people, reaching people, activating them. The, the targeting that you can do through an effective digital and online campaign, as well as uh, combining the social media elements to it, is just unbelievable. And it provides an efficiency for clients, I think, and organizations that have public policy challenges that they've been looking for for a long time because they're looking to do more with less these days. I think that's the key. The, the key is that, that analytical component. We can know now, thanks to technology, what conversations are happening where in real time who is influencing whom and how are they influencing them? And then we design and execute the government relations strategy uh, in reaction to that. Um, so. And you know, so what are just, we've sort of covered digital, but what are some of the other key components to a successful message campaign? And really, what would you tell clients um, who are seeking to influence a public policy debate in this new world, as you, as you suggested, of advocacy? Look, I think, I think it really boils down to a really simple sort of recipe. Um, we have, you know, our industry for years has spent a lot of time talking about uh, sophisticated message development, media training, all these sort of uh, tools in the toolkit. But I want to emphasize that if you are providing the right messages to the wrong messenger, you will fail. If you are training for media exposure, the wrong spokesperson, you will fail. It's the marriage of the two that makes the difference. Exactly. And, you know, I would say that... Um, 
there's the basic blocking and tackling of a political campaign. I, I frankly think organizations like the political campaign approach, because what are political campaigns? They're fast, they're agile, um, they're flexible, and uh, they're aggressive when they need to be. And I think that organizations and, and interest groups that have public policy challenges are looking for those type of characteristics. Um, and that is what you get when you combine a sound government relations strategy with a public affairs strategy like we do here at the Podesta Group. And you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is recognizing again who you're going after and how to get to them and the analytics that you can get from a digital campaign on a daily basis and be able to shift so quickly with the ads that you're running or the messages that you're sending to these people is really remarkable and it just presents tremendous opportunity. Perfect. Well, thank you both. Thank, thank you for your expertise and lending Absolutely. your expertise to our, our topic today. And for more insight on turning good stories into effective advocacy or other policy developments here in Washington, keep your eyes on the PG Pipeline.